Nabokov greatly enjoyed April Fool's Day jokes, codes and word games. As a young man living in Berlin and Paris, he regularly contributed crossword puzzles to the Russian emigre papers. His unique writing style included integrating cryptic style clues, anagram games and acrostics into his short stories and novels. On one occasion he played a hoax that extended well beyond the literary page. He fooled a Russian critic into writing a review of a poet named Vasily Shishkov, who simply did not exist. When asked, Nabokov strenuously insisted truly great art was fantastically deceitful and complex. Nabokov dropped hints about an ulterior purpose to his own memoirs in a letter sent to Doubleday editor Kenneth McCormick in 1946. He explained he was writing a new kind of autobiography, or rather a new hybrid between that and a novel. The new genre would involve a mystery story about a man's past in which innocent-looking ingredients would deliver a quite unexpected brew. The letter establishes that Nabokov intended to hide a secret in his memoirs that would somehow interweave with a novel. Released as conclusive evidence in the US and as speak, memory, a memoir in the UK, Nabokov's autobiography duly delivers on his promise. Its final chapter ends by challenging the reader to find what the sailor has hidden. Perhaps then we should start feeling anxious about the letter Nabokov sent in 1954 to New Directions editor James Lachlan, where he gauged his interest in publishing a so-called time bomb. The letter was accompanied by a draft manuscript of Lolita. Throwing more fuel on the fire are two statements Nabokov made in the 1960s, when a BBC reporter asked, why did you write Lolita? The author denied having any moral or social purpose. But I like composing uh, riddles. I like uh, finding elegant solutions uh, to, to my riddles. Talking to Playboy magazine in 1964, Nabokov once again stressed his novel's riddling qualities. Lolita, he stated, was like a beautiful puzzle. Its composition and its solution at the same time, since one is a mirror view of the other. Is it possible Lolita was written as a hoax? If so, what sort of hoax is it? As his preoccupation with the number 342 suggests, Nabokov was fascinated by paranormal phenomena, including meaningful coincidences and repeating patterns and numbers. He believed certain dates contained fatidic or fateful overtones. He was especially intrigued by the confusion around his birth date after Russia switched from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar in the early 20th century. As a result, Nabokov's original birth date, April 10, was pushed forward to either April 22nd or April 23rd. While April the 22nd is technically more correct, Nabokov preferred to celebrate his birthday on the later date. He was fond of pointing out that April 23rd is also the birthday of William Shakespeare and Shelley Temple. Mistaken identity and gender-bending games are common features of Shakespeare's comedies and dramas. Three of the bard's female characters disguise themselves as men. Curious gender ambiguities similarly arise in Lolita, where Humbert is bewitched by the twofold nature of his nymphette. His tomboy daughter has boys' knees, wears boys' shirts, and is incorrectly addressed as Mon Petit instead of Ma Petite. At the Enchanted Hunter's Hotel, Humbert compares Lolita to an immortal daemon disguised as a female child. He later allows Lolita to participate in a school play on the proviso that male roles are taken by females. We move a step closer to solving Nabokov's riddle when we notice how the author made a surprising personal appearance within Lolita courtesy of a thinly disguised anagram game. He is Quilted's silent mistress, Vivian Darkbloom. Vivian's puzzling presence is heightened by the identity question posed by Quilty's name. In the French language, Quilty or Quilty asks, Who is he to you? The air of mystery surrounding Vivian and Quilty's relationship is compounded by the theatrical prompt linking Lolita 
to Nabokov's own memoirs. In Lolita's Forward, the reader is told Vivian Darkbloom has written a biography entitled My Q. Lolita's strange gender conundrums and riddles are compounded by the novel's famous postscript. This essay contains traces of Nabokov's initial intention to name his nymphette after the cross-dressing saviour of France, Joan of Arc. Some of the lies Nabokov told within his postscript are also revealing. Drawing greater suspicion is his insistence that a US publisher agreed to publish his novel if I turned my Lolita into a 12-year-old lad and had him seduced by Humbert, a farmer in a barn. Evidence backing up this statement has never been found. Vera Nabokov's biographer, Stacy Schiff, conducted several fruitless searches about this matter in the Nabokov archives. In the end, she concluded, no US publisher ever suggested that the author transform his 12-year-old into a boy or Humbert into a farmer, as Nabokov later claimed. The unanswered questions raised by Lolita demand careful appraisal of the profile Nabokov provides within his memoirs of his effete and very flamboyant uncle, Vasily Ivanovich Rukovishnikov. Uncle Ruka was employed as a diplomat in the Tsarist Foreign Service. His residence in Russia was a colonnaded mansion located not far from the Nabokov's summer estate. Ruka was a flashy dresser and talented musician who loved logic, word games and excelled at breaking codes. Within speak memory, Nabokov recalled testing his uncle with the numerical equivalent of Hamlet's famous soliloquy. Ruka deciphered the code in a flash. Ruka shares several striking traits with Humbert. Like Humbert, Ruka was an erudite scholarly dandy whose preferred language was French. He experienced some difficulties with speech and pronunciation. Like his literary incarnation, Ruka died of heart failure when he was only 42 years old. Is it mere coincidence that the age gap between Ruka and Vladimir is identical to that between Humbert and Lolita? Ruka was a regular visitor at Vira. He singled Vladimir out for special attention, bestowing gifts upon his favourite nephew, such as the Buster Brown novels and Foxy Grandpa comics. Ruka was more than a bit besotted with his handsome young nephew. Within speak memory, Nabokov described how his uncle would fondle him and murmur endearments in his ear. The possessive manner Ruka displayed towards Vladimir is very evident in the family photo taken in 1907. We can see he has a rather firm grip on his nephew's hand and is pressing up against him, forcing Vladimir into a half-sitting position on his knee. Ruka had a reputation for engaging in inappropriate sexual behaviour. The peasants living on his estate christened him with a crude Russian nickname meaning the bottom feeler. Within his memoirs, Nabokov recalled how Ruka would sometimes pretend to give him a present while placing a green leaf in his hand and stating, Pour vous, mon neveu, la chose la plus belle au monde, une feuille verte. This outwardly innocent scene should ring alarm bells, as green leaf seems to be a code once used by the pedophile community. Throughout the 1960s and 1980s, the San Diego based imprint Green Leaf Classics published various pulp fiction novels laced with incestuous and pedophilic themes. Nabokov made apt use of the ominous metaphor in his writings. A fragment of green leaf sticks to Emmy's front teeth as she dances flirtatiously around Cincinnatus's cell. In The Enchanter, Maria has a shriveled leaf stuck in her hair, which Arthur tries to pluck out. Humbert laments that the now mature Lolita is only a dead leaf echo of the nymphette he used to roll on. While discussing the difficulties of translation, Nabokov once unnecessarily instructed, a red autumn leaf is a red autumn leaf is a red autumn leaf, not a deflowered nymphette. Within speak memory, he vividly recalls how his uncle Ruka once composed a French romance song describing leaves of violent colours. He sang out loud for all to hear, accompanying his high tenor voice at the piano. The scene eerily prefigures the encoded Wonderland song found in Kelly Top. 
this haunting memory was arguably revisited in Lolita when Quilty plays his final frantic chords at the piano. Coincidences like these help explain Nabokov's delight at sharing his birthday with Shakespeare and Shirley Temple. In solving Nabokov's Lolita riddle, Joanne Morgan has argued that the riddles surrounding Lolita's gender and Quilty's identity are ultimately answered by the literary games that connect Lolita to Ben Sinister. Completed immediately prior to Lolita, in Ben Sinister, Nabokov alludes to a Shakespearean conspiracy that implicates libraries and scholars alike in a massive public hoax. The main character, Adam Krug, is the sole guardian of an eight-year-old boy named David. Despite his scholarly, heroic ways, Krug has lecherous designs on his underage housemaid Mariette. Foreshadowing the plotline of Lolita, he imagines Mariette sitting in his lap during the rehearsal of a play in which she was supposed to be his daughter. Another clue connecting Lolita to Ben Sinister is established when Humbert sends a telegram booking a room at the Enchanted Hunter's Hotel. The simple task throws Humbert into an identity crisis. At the same time, Lolita's status shifts from a daughter into a gender-neutral child. What shall I put? Humbert and daughter? Humberg and small daughter? Homburg and immature girl? Homburg and child? The droll mistake, the G at the end, which eventually came through, may have been a telepathic echo of these hesitations of mine. This mysterious passage is actually part of a very unconventional trans-novel crossword puzzle. In Ben Sinister, we find Nabokov teasing the reader with an anagram game based on Adam Krug's name. Suggestions thrown out include Gumakrad, Dramaguk, and Gurdamak. However, if we follow Lolita's telepathic instructions and obediently drop the G from the end of Krug, the remaining seven letters reveal the stunning answer Mad Ruka. Cross novel hijinks like these are unprecedented in the literary world. However, they are in keeping with Nabokov's unique interactive style. During a 1967 Paris Review interview, Nabokov did warn I fill in the gaps of the crossword at any spot I happen to choose. The solution, Mad Ruka, at last provides an answer to the riddling question posed by Quilty's name. It also explains why Nabokov appears with an elite as Quilty's drag queen mistress, Vivian Darkbloom, author of My Q. The solution sheds light on a disturbing scene in Ben Sinister. As highlighted in Joanne Morgan's research, within this passage, Nabokov unexpectedly switches from Adam Krug's third person narrative to the first person voice of an abused child. He recalls how an unidentified man once saw me crying when I was ten and led me to a looking glass in an unused room with an empty parrot cage in the corner so that I might study my dissolving face. In every mask I tried on there were slits for his eyes, even at the very moment when I was rocked by the convulsion men value most. An equally telling switch to the first person voice of the abused child is also found in Lolita. There we find Nabokov remembering how his tormentor once mimed and mocked me while enmeshing me in my thrashing anguish in his demoniacal game. The author then went on to provide some tantalizing clues as to his abuser's identity, indicating he spoke French, was well read, had distinctive handwriting, and was well versed in artful deception and logomancy or word magic. These unusual traits all accord with the information Nabokov provides about his uncle Ruka within his memoirs.